Bill Wolf. I'm an assistant professor of communication studies at St. Joe's in Philly. This is on the ethics, methods, and publication of publicly private not okay election tweets. The not okay election tweets began soon after the Washington Post published uh, the story uh, Trump reported having extremely lewd conversations about women in 2005. And as you know, uh, these, uh, this recording uh, showed Trump uh, and his most depraved and disgusting uh, treatment toward women. Uh, soon after this article appeared, Sofin Deb, a New York Times reporter, uh, tweeted a link to it. Um, that was at 1.36 p.m. on the 16th, um, I'm sorry, on the 7th. And uh, soon after that, a chemist named Diana Hunt retweeted that article. Uh, one of her followers replied to her. Um, and then soon after that, uh, Laura J., who is a, uh, an author, uh, replied, the rage has been unleashed in me, literally sitting in my Chicago hotel room screaming. And she's the first person to apply the not okay hashtag uh, to this subject matter. Prior to that, not okay was used for a variety of different things that people deemed uh, not to be okay. Um, meanwhile, while this was going on, uh, so that was by 2.45 p.m. Meanwhile, uh, Kelly Oxford, uh, the author, uh, began tweeting uh, about this issue. At 1.51, she tweeted a retweet. At 1.55, she began tweeting on her own. She had a series of about 10 tweets on the subject. And then at 4.46 p.m., uh, she said, women, tweet me your first assaults. They aren't just that. I'll go first. And then she re-upped that call um, on at 4:56 p.m., uh, women keep tweeting me assaults with, and she started, and she requested that people add the not okay hashtag. Uh, at that point, we had what was necessary to create a global phenomenon uh, with these not okay with the not okay tweets, where hundreds of thousands of women were tweeting their sexual assaults either directly to Kelly Oxford or uh, with or with the hashtag by by itself. Um, and I, I, soon later that evening, I began archiving uh, the not okay tweets. I've got an archive of about 300,000 uh, that are related to that um, using tag 6.1 and uh, DMIT cat. Uh, so what can we do with the data? Uh, that's, that's a big question. We can code it as uh, many people have coded tweets, myself uh, including using grounded theory. We could show that they're sharing, revealing, advocating, they're shaming, they're supporting. There's, there's all sorts of stuff happening in there. Um, and and many other kinds of things. We can map it using a software like, like Gephi. So here we have a co-hashtag graph, which shows relationships between the kinds of hashtags that are in the tweet. Uh, direct lines indicate that those two hashtags appeared in the same tweet together. So here you'll see that not okay and Trump tapes uh, were very prominently uh, appeared in, in the tweets themselves. Also, rape culture uh, was directly connected to that. Uh, we can also do look at the relationships between the people who are doing the tweeting. Uh, we can create in-degree or out-degree maps. In-degree maps indicate uh, how often somebody was mentioned, either through a reply or a retweet. So on the left, we see that the big blue dot is uh, Kelly Oxford. Um, is been mentioned quite a bit through the retweets. On the right, the out-degree is how often people are tweeting. Uh, so you can see that she's re receiving a lot of uh, mentions or retweets, but isn't tweeting as often as, as many other people who are out there. Uh, we can also begin to look at some of the communities uh, that we are beginning to see, uh, like the pink community, the Gethy very nicely groups things, and we can start to figure out, okay, how are these people related? Uh, one thing that I can show you, however, is those names, um, because there's a question of privacy, is revealing the names of the people who, who were doing the tweeting a violation of their, their privacy. I also am not able to quote directly uh, from these tweets in public, in official publications, especially without 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 their permission, um, as you probably know, privacy in an online space exists on a spectrum, where we go from something that is specifically private to semi-private, semi-public, and, and, and public. Um, uh, public figures like Kelly Oxford have tweets that are in the public realm. They are more assumed to be public. They are public figures, and we don't really need to get permission to to show those tweets and. In a public space or in a, in a kind of a public, an official publication or scholarship. However, uh, the people who are doing the tweeting with the hashtag might have been expecting a certain level of privacy uh, in here. They might not have expected, for example, somebody to be archiving them and talking about them in the presentation or writing about them later on. Um, certainly, ish things were uh, subjects of extremely sensitive nature, such as in, in the tweets that are with the not okay. Um, 
they would need some permission in order to, to move forward. And so this is a question of thinking about data and how do we consider the tweets that are actually appearing in the, in the archive. Are they data or are they something more than that? And with tweets on social justice and social movement issues, I would advocate that they are very much more stories um, in, in the way that uh, stories have been used for social justice uh, for, for decades, for hundreds of years. Um, Catherine Fossil, who's a um, gender uh, studies professor, argues that the individual telling of one's own story has been central to movement building in most, if not all, modern social justice crusades around the globe. Uh, sociologist um, Gary Allen Fine argues that social movements are actually collections or bundles of stories that are co come together to help um, make the case for that particular movement and uh, the social justice issues that the, the movement is advocating for. Uh, Fossil argues that the personal narrative recounted in a service of social justice also has the dimension of witnessing or uh, authorizing an experience previously marginalized, such as women's sexual assault. Uh, telling one's own story thus has a collective purpose and can work as a consciousness raising, even a community organizing tactic. And we see that very much happening in the um, in the not okay tweets, Kelly Oxford's calls for women to tell their stories were um, was an act of calling them, and to, that would lead to consciousness raising, and may have you know have been a, a an example of community organizing to organize this group of women to tell their stories and to make known what was previously hidden. Uh, the question becomes, what can be done with the tweets themselves, these stories? Um, Catherine Fossil says that because she's ultimately more concerned with historical, rhetorical, and feminist interpretations than with literary ones, her emphasis remains primarily on her subject's spoken or written words. And yet, because of the ethics guidelines that we have in place, we are not able to quote from these specific tweets. That is, we cannot actually use their written words in discussions of the things that they are in discussions or scholarship about the not okay tweets. Uh, and this is problematic because it doesn't, because coding or mapping or even just summarizing does not maintain an authentic telling of a particular story. And in doing so, we might be violating uh, those women again by not really telling their stories. Um, accurately and in a way that honors them. Um, so there are scholarly challenges and ethical questions here. How are we to write effectively about stories of sensitive nature posted to social media, especially when they are part of social movements, movements when ethical guidelines suggest we can't quote from them? What are we supposed to do about that? Certainly we can ask permission, but is even asking permission at a later time a violation of a user's privacy? Asking permission at a later time indicates to them that we have been archiving their tweets and is the act of archiving a violation of privacy? Um, I'm not sure the answer to that question. Uh, should we even be able to archive such sensitive stories without IRB permission? Uh, lots of the scholarship on, on ethics and methods suggest that um, when the material is of a sensitive nature, uh, it should get IRB approval even before the archiving process starts. But waiting for IRB permission is impractical because of the speed of online social movements. If I had waited to gain access to these to, to apply for IRB approval, I, I might still not know uh, the answer to that question, and I never would have been able to gain access to those tweets because they would have been gone uh, so quickly. Um, so what are we supposed to do about that when we want to maintain ethical concerns and, and but the modes that we have for approving uh, the, uh, and the mechanisms, I'm sorry, we have for approving of research uh, do not represent or do not take into consideration the, the speed of the technologies that people are using for presenting um, their thoughts and feelings. Um, so. Very quickly, my, the conclusion here is more of a question. There is a need to write about not okay election tweets, uh, but the question is how? 
but how? How do we do so in a way that remains true to the stories that these women have told, but also respects them and their privacy? Thank you.